In Exodus chapter 14, you will get to the place where, where God has told Moses, I want you to go and I want you to let my I want you to bring my people out of captivity. So Moses did it. He didn't necessarily want to, but he did it. And then he was leading them out. And when he was leading them out, they were trying to get away. And then Pharaoh decided to chase after them some more because God hardened his heart. And I always thought when I was reading through this story, I thought, why would God harden his heart? He wanted them to be free. Now they're free. And then God goes back to the captor, captor and says, go get them. And I realized as I was even, you know, as I studied it, and even this week as I was putting this together, I realized some more stuff. I realized that, that, that God wanted them to be so free that they knew that even though they had left Egypt, they, they could still end up back in Egypt. So he wanted them to be so free that he sent Pharaoh after them to go get them so that he could show Israel exactly what freedom meant. And so we'll get to that in a little bit. But they go through their, their journey, and then they come up to this block, this roadblock. The Red Sea is standing in their way. They got Egypt behind them. They got freedom in front of them. And in the middle of their, where they're standing is the Red Sea. And that is where we're going to pick up our, our, uh, our text today. We're going to start at verse 15. Are you ready? Good. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm just going to go. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over the army and his chariots and horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and horsemen and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and a pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of, the, of Israel. Thus it was a cloud of darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other. So that the one did not come near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused. Later on, this is going to be important. The Lord caused. So if you have a Bible and you want to underline that, that will be important later. The Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. That's also important. And made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on to their left. And, e and the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty." And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh came into the sea after them, not as much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and their waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of Egypt, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord, hello, and believed him and his servant Moses. So I want to take that passage. I know it was a little bit of reading, and we're going to talk about the topic of can't touch this. Now, I'm going to pray in a minute, but before I pray, I want to know, is there anybody in the room that just started singing that to the tune of MC Hammer. Can't touch this. Okay, I got some hands. Okay, we're good. So now we all are on the same page, because when I thought about that, I thought all I could think of was can't touch this. All right, let's pray. 
Father, we are so grateful that we are in your presence today, that we can come here and that we could hear from you. We can hear your word, that we can speak truth. God, I pray that you would use me today to, to, to present your word to your people, God, that you would speak through me, speak to me, and use me today to just understand the full power of what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When we started the year, I told you that I was praying about some things, and, and, and I felt like this was the year that God said he was going to take us forward. Now, every week we come in, and and in and, 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 and our personal lives, we might be going forward, and sometimes we can look around and we can say, maybe it looks like we're going backwards. But I understand one thing to be true. If God gives you a word, his word does not return to him void. And if God said it, it will happen. And so maybe in your life, you've already seen some forward movement. Maybe in the church, you've already seen some forward movement. Maybe in your job, in, in your family, you've already seen some forward movement. And, and I feel like God would say to you, today, that is just the beginning. We're, on, we're going through our fifth month right now. There's still a lot of 2018 left, and God is still moving us forward. He's moving us to a new place. He's moving us to a new destiny. And what I wanted to share with you today, the main topic, the main theme of what I'm going to discuss is this right here. If you start strong, you have to stay strong. It's easy to start off strong. How many people at the end of the year, they say, or, or even at the end of the week, they say, Monday starts my diet. It don't never start today. It starts Monday. I, I'm telling you what, I'm going to eat like a heifer all weekend because Monday I'm going on a diet. I am going to do something. Man, I'm going to get all lean. I'm going to have a six pack. And, 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 and you still end up at the end of the year with the same one pack you had when you started. But it's all right. It's okay. It's easy to start something strong. It's hard to stay strong. Exodus 14 is a strong passage of Scripture. Moses walked into the Pharaoh and through plagues and through everything else, he said, let my people go. And finally, after the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt, the Pharaoh looked at him and said, get out of here. Just get out of here. And what's important to notice is that when you leave a place, you leave, when, when God makes you leave something, you leave with more than what you came in with. God doesn't let you leave somewhere the same way you came in. If you're living for God and you're doing it correctly, every time we get together, we should leave the church in a different way than we came in. We should leave our, 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 our legacy of what we have behind us when we, when we go on. We should leave a legacy that is better than what we had. And so many people as parents, we look and we say, I just want my children to have better than I had. Because we always want what's coming to be better than what has already happened. And so Exodus 14 is about a strong start and then they get on their journey and the strength starts to wear off a little bit. Israel is out of Egypt, but not truly free yet. And that's how we get in life. We're free for a minute, but then we get tired and we get worried, and we start noticing everything else that's going on around us, and we start thinking, why did I leave? Yeah, I didn't necessarily like my circumstances, but at least I knew where my food was coming from. At least I knew that I was going to be able, why did I start this journey? And then we start to wonder, and, and where we started off so strong, we lose our fight, and we go back to the captivity that has held us for so long. And that's what made me think, of this title. Can't touch this. Can't touch this. I'm so strong with God behind me that the enemy can't touch this. People might not like me, but you can't touch me. People might not want to hear what I have to say, but you can't touch me. The enemy might want to shut me down, but you can't touch me. He's been trying to kill me since before I was born, but you can't touch me. When God has a promise for your life, there is nothing that the enemy can do that will shut you down because God's purpose is greater than his attacks. And when you really focus on what God has called you to be, no enemy can touch you. Can't touch this. You walk around and you can get right in his face and you can say, nope, not today, devil, can't touch this. Isaiah has a hat that says, not today, Satan. He got it from a concert. I just think it's cool and I would like to have it. I try to steal it every now and then and he catches me every time because, you know, not that I would steal from him. I borrow, yeah, yeah, we borrow. I borrow from him. 
Ashley can make me one. See, this is why you support good businesses, because then when you support good businesses, they support you. That's what I'm talking about. How many people in their heads started singing MC Hammer? I did. Man, I, I, was, I, was, I was sitting there writing it down, and when I was making the slide, I, every, the whole time I was putting it together, all I was doing was singing the song. Just going on and on and on. And it reminded me of, of when I was a kid, I used to play football. And I'm going to be honest, I only played like one or two seasons, I don't remember. And, and, and I, didn't, I didn't stick with it, I actually quit, which is I think one of the reasons why now I don't quit, I refuse to quit, because I know what it's like to quit. I know what it's like to, to give up in something that you... And the reason I quit was because I hated practice. I loved football. I loved my position. I got to play defense, and nothing made me happier than breaking through a line and hitting the quarterback as hard as I could and potentially hurting him. I, not the hurting him part, but just getting to get in there and just hit him real hard. And maybe if he dropped the ball, that was even better, and I loved it. Maybe it was because I was frustrated, and I just liked to get in there. And, but then we would have to do nonsense practice. We would have to put on all these pads and run all the way around the largest piece of property in the whole town, it seemed like, until we threw up and the coach was like, throw up and then keep running. And I was like, why are we doing this? But the coach understood that sometimes you're going to face some things in life that you're not ready for if you don't practice. And we get to the place where we have these battles and we might be bigger than what's in front of us and we can get through the line, but we can't get all the way to the goal because there is something so much bigger. And if we don't practice, if we don't read our Bible, if we don't worship by ourselves in our own home, if we don't pray, if we don't make it our purpose to do what God has asked us to do, to raise our children in a way that God would be honored, to live our life, to be the employee that God can look at and say that's right that's my child right there look they're doing their work as for the Lord they're doing exactly what I needed them to do there is something that we might face that God knows we need to go through some practice but I think and maybe a lot of you won't get this I get my Ellen Iverson on practice he got it <laughs> we're talking about practice not a game we're talking about now that is a two and a half minute clip of that over and over again. And it's funny, but I won't give you all of that. I understand now the importance of practice, because until you practice, you can never truly be untouched. I remember people running backs and stuff in practice, they would get the ball and they would run through and they would be gone. And on one hand, it made me so angry, but on another hand, it gave me drive, because if I was so focused on the quarterback, I missed where he put the ball. If I was so focused on what I wanted, I missed the ultimate goal of stopping the ball from getting to the end zone. Sometimes we focus so much on what we want that we miss God's ultimate goal in our life of getting us to our destination. Our destination is hand in hand with what God has created us to be. If you're good at something, it's because God has a purpose for you. And maybe that's where he chose you to be. Maybe you're not going to get up and preach a sermon, but you know how to you know how to do electrical wiring so good that you can have any job and you want. And God put you in that house to do that electrical wiring, not because they needed light, but because you need needed to be a light to the people around you. You needed to show somebody Jesus. You needed to show somebody that there's a better way. God needed you there because somebody was going to come onto that job site that is just leaving through a divorce and they are thinking about suicide. But God knew that if he could put his person in that place, that there would be a change and a shift. And all we have to do is focus on God. Y'all were clapping last week. You're leaving me hanging today. I'm going to come keep coming. I'm going to keep coming and get your clappers ready. All right. When I played football, I played defense. And I would yell at him. I would talk trash. I would, I would look at the quarterback and I'd be like, you're going down! I'm going to smash you. I would, say, I would say dumb, corny things that I've seen in movies like, you're on the tracks and the train's coming through! And I ain't have enough. I ain't have enough weight on me when I was a teenager or a young kid to be saying all that. And like now, I could say it because I'm a full-figured, voluptuous man. But back then, I was just. Now you want to make noise and laugh. I see how it is. All right, all right. <laughs> I would get so focused on what I was doing. I would make the quarterback focus so much on my big mouth and yelling and hollering that he would forget to pay attention to the fact that there's another side. 
And if you get so focused on one thing, you miss that there can be an attack coming from another side. And, and when the attack comes from the other side, it hits you so cleanly because you never even saw it coming. I was so focused on my marriage that I never thought my 12-year-old would come home and tell me that she's pregnant. I was so focused on, on getting out of drugs myself that I never thought that my wife would leave me because I couldn't keep myself together. We're so focused on one part of our life that we don't even see the attack coming from the other side. But there's always an attack. There's always something ready to get you. It's like playing chess. In Orlando, we had this group that would get together and play chess. It was like a, like a church group, and I know it sounds very dynamic, and it was really fun. And if you don't like chess, it's probably really boring sounding to you, but it was really fun because he would take chess games that were played by these champions, and he would put them up on the board, and he would move them, and he would show us where they made their critical mistake, and then he would tie it in to a Bible principle, and he would teach us the Bible through playing chess. And then after we got done with the, the Bible lesson part of it, we would play chess for hours if we had the time and we would just play chess and one of the things he always told us was that to win and be successful in chess you have to you have to cover the you have to attack the middle of the board you need to control the middle of the board and you need to protect the king and you need to always move forward the only time you should move backward in a chess game is if it's setting up a forward move in the next move you have to always be ready to attack the enemy that you're facing and be ready for attacks against the enemy. Do you understand what I'm saying to you today? And so uh, I, would, I would do this. And the only way that you can win in chess is you have to eliminate the king. And I am here to tell you that there is an enemy outside who is trying to neutralize your king. He's trying to keep you away from the king that is inside of you. He's trying to pull you away from the effectiveness. He's trying to make you focus on something else so you can forget about your king. But it goes so much farther than just the game of chess. Chess is a metaphor for life. You have to be strategic in what you do. You have to be always ready for the next move. You have to um, look ahead at what somebody else might do. And above all else, you have to protect your king because he's vulnerable if you leave him open. And if your king is vulnerable, it's easy to get to him. And if I can get to the king, I can get to you. If I can get you away from your king, if I can get you away from your God, I can beat you down. If I can get you away from your God, I can make you feel like you're not good enough. If I can get you away from your God, I can make you feel like the worst parent in the world. If I can get you away from your God, I can feel like you have no chance. But if you stay focused on your king, there is no attack that the enemy can come that will stop your king from living its purpose in your life. Protect your king. If you want to win, you have to watch the king. Keep him safe. Keep him in your heart. Know where the king is all the time. Know where he is on the board of your life. You have to have a relationship with the king. You have to let the king dictate the flow of the game. Here's a move in chess. And after I would move a couple things, it would be like my fourth or fifth move. And it, I think it, I forget what it's called, but I know that I need to do it. I think it's called castling your king. And when you castle your king, you put your king inside this like fortress and he's guarded. And the only way your king is vulnerable is if somebody takes out a part of your defense or if you open it up. And so I always try to keep my king on the chessboard protected and castled inside. And that is what God wants us to do. He wants us to hold him in our heart. He wants us to understand that he is important to us. And if we're going to win in life and we're going to win in this game, we have to protect the king from any attack. There's always going to be another player who has different moves, who knows new things. When we were kids, we used to play chess. And my brother used to make me want to throw him out the window because he learned how to do some stupid like three move checkmate. And I, I wanted to flip the table over and, and break the chess pieces because, to me, that's not strategy. That's memorizing a plan. And the problem with that is that your enemy in life, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, the one who wants to keep you away from your king, he knows 
better than a three-move checkmate. He, knew, he knows better than a two-move checkmate. He knows exactly where to hit you to neutralize your king. So you have to be ready to fight for your king. You have to be ready to keep him safe and protected. You have to be ready because sometimes the best offense is a good defense. And I want to look at a few things today that are going to help us move forward in this passage. A few ways that you can look at the enemy in life and you can tell him you can't touch this. Now I know what you're thinking. He's already touching on points. It's only 1051. Stop it. I got plenty of points for you so don't. We might get done early. You never know. Listen, if you're writing stuff down, I want you to write these few points down. It's going to help you move forward in your life. I'm giving you false hope is what I'm doing. Number one, the number one thing to lead you, to tell you, to to let you tell your enemy you can't touch this is direction. Direction. Verse 15 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to move forward. Move forward, forward, one step after the next. Move forward. The enemy might knock you back a little bit, but don't. If, if you don't gain ground, at least don't lose ground. Stand there strong against the attacks of the enemy. And after, the, after you have done all that you can do to stand, just stand there. Remain strong. Keep your feet planted that any attack that will come at you, you can stand up against it. You have to know the direction. And Moses told, or God told them, move forward. But it's interesting that he says, why did you cry to me? Why do you cry to me? Because to the outside, to the four million people that Moses was leading out of Egypt, Moses looked like he was strong. He looked like he had it all together. He looked like he had it going on, that he knew exactly what to do. He could walk up into the palace and he could tell them, let my people go or else this is going to happen. You're going to get frogs. You're going to get bugs. You're going to get all this stuff happening to you. You let my people go or it's on. And it's, it's, it's very interesting that Moses was put in the middle of one king battling another king. And that is how we end up in life. We are, one in the, we are in the middle of a battle. It's a battle for you, and it's a battle for me. On one hand, we have the king of eternity. We have the king of heaven. We have the king of glory. And on one hand, we have the king of this earth, the, the, the lord of the, of the earth, the king of the principalities of where we live today. And so we find ourselves on earth in the middle of a chess game between the king of heaven and the king of earth. And if we're not careful on what we do, we start going in the wrong direction, and then then we end up in a bad situation. It's important to know the direction that you go. And Moses had it all figured out to the outside. But God knew something about Moses that the four or five million Israelites didn't know. They knew that on the inside there was a struggle. They knew that when Moses was alone and he was crying out to God. You can be the most effective leader that the world has ever seen, but if you're not down crying out to God, then you're just leading in what you have. You have to get down and cry out to God. It's one thing to come in and to say, I'm going to start the church. We're going to build a ministry. By yourself, it's impossible. With God, you can do anything. You have to know. Why do you cry to me, Moses? Why do you cry to me, Moses? Why do you cry to me, Stephanie? Why do you cry to me, Dustin? Why, Jessica? Why do you cry to me? Why do you cry out to me? Because I need you, God. I need to know the direction that you have for me. I need to know where you're leading my steps, that where you go, I will follow. Have you ever, like, like maybe Dustin has, you have small children. Um, have, you ever, have you ever walked out to the car in the snow and there's a bunch of snow and, and your children try to come out behind you and you watch them and they can't move as easily in the snow as you can because what is nothing to you is something really deep to them. And so what, what I, I seen one of our kids, I don't, I, it would have had to have been Jaden or, no, it would have had to have been Elijah, and, and he was coming outside, and it was snowing, and, and, and he was struggling to get through the snow, and I told him, if you just step where I stepped, if you just walk where I walked, what you're struggling through will come much easier. And God would look at us and say, if you would just follow my steps, the struggle that you have now will come a lot easier to you, because you will have guidance 
Why do you cry to me, Moses? Because I need to know where to go. And I need to know that you're there with me. They left Egypt. Now what? We get to the place in our lives where we get tired of going forward and we forget about where we came from. They wasn't even out of bondage long before they wanted to go back. In Exodus 16, just two chapters later, the people that God saved from captivity, from bondage, from slavery, they said this, they said they, they, they remembered it different out there than they remembered it when they were in there. They looked back for the good old days and they said, oh, that we had died by the Lord in the hand of Egypt. In other words, why couldn't we die while we were still in Egypt? At least there we had meat. We had food. At least there we had bread and we got filled up. And you have brought us out here, Moses, to die of hunger. Why are you crying out to me, Moses? Because I don't know how to lead these people. I need direction, God. I need you to show me. You told us to move forward, but I can't lead them forward if you don't show me how. And that is the heart, and that should be the heart of any person in ministry, any person who would call themselves, I know pastors that I won't even call pastor because they live a title and they don't live a ministry. If I'm not down giving God everything I am and saying, God, I need you to lead me so that when I lead the people, I'm leading from a place of security. I'm leading from a place of knowing who you are. If If God ain't leading me, then I shouldn't be leading anybody. Not a church, not a job, not a family. If I'm not following God, then I'm just wandering around with everybody else. How do we get forward? God will always call you to move forward, and he tells you to never give up. Don't quit now. You're almost at your breakthrough. You're almost at your breakthrough. If you would have just fought a little bit more, the end was right there. But you turned around and you walked away. I seen a picture of a guy digging, digging through underground to try to find diamonds. He got to the place where the, 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 he stopped digging and, 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 and he turned around and the diamonds were literally like an inch away from him. But he stopped because he got discouraged. He stopped because he didn't see that there was an end. He thought it was too late. I've already dug. If I was going to hit my diamonds, I would have found them by now. And that's where we get. If I was going to hit my purpose, I would have hit it by now. If I was going to do something, I would have done it by now. God, if you were going to move, you would have moved by now. How do I get forward? At least he's clapping somewhat, getting it going. There you go. He's giving, he's giving me the, he's giving me the amens. Maybe like Israel, you have been held captive for too long, and God is calling you to free, freedom, freedom in your finances. You've looked at your check account with one eye for like six years. You're like, what is this gonna? And then, and then one day God just goes, he, he works something, and you're like, oh wow, this is. I could open both my eyes to look at it now. I don't have, like, sometimes we squint and just act like there's more zeros than there is or, like, act like it's, like, maybe if I close one eye and look at it in a certain kind of, the red numbers turn black, that's not how it works. But God is going to do something new in our finances, in our relationships, the people that you're around, the people that you hang out with, in your family, he's going to bring freedom. The, 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 the children that you pray for, the grandchildren that you pray for, the, the husband, the wife that you pray for, the things that you think are never going to change. God is ready to do something and make a shift in your life. But we have to do what he's called us to do and we have to follow him. He calls us to come out, come out of our bondage, come out of our sin, come out of what keeps us away from God, come out about caring what everybody else thinks. You can laugh if you want to, but I am coming out. I'm not going to be trapped in bondage. I'm not going to be locked in my shame. I'm not go- I'm going to come out brand new. I'm going to come out better than I went in. I'm going to come out whole. I'm going to come out complete. And I'm going to come out healed because of who Jesus is. I, got, I gave myself to Jesus. And then I, I started seeing these people at church. And they would wear these shirts. And they would wear these Christian shirts and these shirts would have these cool slogans and they would have like Bible, Bible verses. And, and, and I have one. I had one that said, um, 
it, it had nails on the back of it, and it said, body piercing saved my life. And, and you know, I, I thought that was like the coolest thing, and so I would wear them. And, and I remember I had one that had nails on the front of it, and it said, tougher than nails. And then on the bottom of it, it had Revelation 118. And, uh, and, and so I was wearing this to a, to a, to a carnival um, because I didn't respect myself enough to not go to a carnival and, and as I was at this car, I'm just joking. If I, as I was at this carnival, I was walking around and, and, and it was something that I was really trying to live. And, and I wasn't fully invested in this relationship with Jesus yet, so I never knew what was going to happen. And, and, and this one of the carny people like looked at my shirt and he goes, Tougher than that! And he started making smart comments. And at that moment, I thought, I probably should take my shirt off because the next person that makes a smart comment, I'm going to punch him in the face. And that's really not going to be what Jesus would do. And so I need to really, I need to really think about this. And then, and so I knew my limits and I knew that I shouldn't, I shouldn't be around them. And, and I never wanted to wear it again because I was afraid of what somebody would say. No, because I was afraid of what would happen if somebody said something dumb again. I have, I have always had this issue um, with my temper, but that's really not important right now. I just want you to know that if you have that same issue, it, it, it happens. And we have to let God work that out in us. And, and it's a process. I've been living for God for long enough now to understand that it is a process because he's still working on it. I still, Chastity says my name and I even think the inflection of her tone is wrong. And I go, oh no, she, oh no, she didn't just say it like that. And I'm like, why are you saying that like that? And she goes, this is just a therapy session with me and you at this point. I just want you to know that, um, that, that that's, you know, I'm in the same place. It's not because I was ashamed of Jesus. I didn't want to hear people's opinion, and I didn't want to let people's opinion pull me back into Egypt. Pull me back in of what I was trying to come out of. Pull me back into being bound by my attitude and by my temper and by my reaction to what other people do. I didn't want people to pull me back in. I had to get out. I, w I was not the Jonathan that I used to be. In the, in the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That means the way I think should reflect Jesus. The way I talk should reflect Jesus. The way I live my life should reflect Jesus because the old Jonathan is gone and everything has become new and I will live my life crucified with Christ. The time to move is now. Don't wait. Go now. Don't want something to happen first. Be full now. Don't walk to your forward. Run now. God is calling you to run out of Egypt and run forward into your tomorrow, into your blessing, into your new life. Don't sit back and live less than what God called you to be forward. Forward. With no direction, you end up right back where you started. On November 1975, 75 convicts started digging a secret tunnel to get them out of their prison and outside the walls of the Saltillo prison in northern Mexico. I probably said that word wrong. Oh, well. On April 18, 1976, guided by their own pure genius, these gentlemen, all 75 of them, dug right out to what they assumed was freedom, and they dug right into the same courthouse, the same courtroom that most of them were sentenced in. And at that moment, the bewildered judge just looked over and said, okay, take them back to prison and give them more time. Because with no idea of where you're going, you will always end back, end back up where you started. But if God is leading you, you have direction. You have direction to move forward. We have to be dedicated to his direction, dedicated to what he has for us. All right, number two. We have to deal with God's protection to move forward. Verse 20, God's protection. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelites. Thus it was a cloud of darkness to the one, and it was a cloud of light to the other. So one did not go near them. 
When you read when they were coming out, the presence of God stood between, or it went over, it went before Israel on their way out. It was guiding them to where God wanted them to be. And it was a pillar of fire by night, so it would light up their way. And it was a pillar of cloud in the daytime, so it would give them shade and they would be cool. And so what they were doing was they were following God's path for forward. And they kept going and they kept going. But then here, when they faced the Red Sea, it came between the two camps and it moved from in front of Israel and got behind Israel and in front of Egypt. And what that says to me is it takes two things. To one, it was darkness. The darkness was to stop the enemy from attacking. It was limiting their ability to stop God's plan. Because if they could see, they could attack. They were there, but they couldn't see. In the Karate Kid Part 3, young Daniel LaRusso leaves the tutelage of Mr. Miyagi. I just said tutelage in a sentence. And he goes to the Cobra Kai Dojo. And they give him three rules. And the last rule that they gave him was if the enemy can't see, he can't fight. In 2 Kings 6, Elisha prayed this same uh, principle that the Syrians would be struck with blindness so that they could get out and, 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 and God will blind your enemies from fighting against you. But in Acts 9, Paul was blinded by Jesus himself because God will blind you against fighting uh, against him. And so the same God that will blind your enemies so they can't attack you is the same God that will blind you so you can't attack him. We have to understand that the vision that we have is so important in moving forward. If we're not focusing on new vision, on new future, on new hope, on new peace, then we are just living in Egypt outside the walls. We are living in our bondage. We look free, we act free, we sound free, but inside we are still bound by the things that held us back for so long. If the enemy can't see, he can't fight. The other one was that it lit, it, it was a light. He put darkness on one side, but he made light for Israel. And that is what we are to do as God's people. Walk in God's purpose. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and honor and glorify your Father in heaven. We are to be a light in a dark world. Have you watched the news and noticed how things are happening? You know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of seeing on my Facebook or on the news or on whatever. I don't have cable, so I hardly see anything on news because I'm too cheap to pay for it. But, uh, you know, all, all the stuff that goes on and, and I got to look at my phone or I got to look at my wherever I get my news and I got to see another school. Somebody was shot. Another school. This happened. Another mall, there was violence. I am so tired of letting the enemy take our vision and put it on other things. Our vision needs to be on one thing. It needs to be on Jesus. If our vision is on Jesus, then we will always follow the same steps. But if our vision is on what Congress could do or what the president could do or what America could do or what anybody else can do, then we're just going to walk in circles around the same captivity. We have to follow God to be free. We have to follow God to be renewed. We have to follow God so that he can move us forward past the tragedy that we see on the television, past the, the worry that we see every day when the kids go to school, Chastity prays for them. And there's a reason she prays for them. She doesn't pray for them because it's a religious ritual. She doesn't pray for them. She prays for them because we live in a fallen world and we have to trust that God is going to surround our children that if some knucklehead walks into Lane Middle School or Snyder High School or Glenwood Elementary School that God is going to surround that school not just our children we pray for the school we pray for the faculty we 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 ask God to watch over them in everything that they do we have to put our focus back on Jesus in moving forward Early American Indians had a unique practice of training young warriors. On the night of their 13th birthday, by their 13th birthday, they had already learned how to scout, how to hunt, how to fish, how to be a man, basically. And so what they would do is they would blindfold them and they would walk them way out into the woods, 13 years old, and their job was to survive the night. And if they could do it, then they understood that they were ready to be warriors. 
And so the 13-year-old boy would get out there with his bow and his arrow, and they would take the blindfold off, and it would be pitch black. He couldn't see nothing. He was in the forest. And all night he was so stressed and so nervous that he couldn't sleep, and he would hear things crack and limbs fall, and he would think, something's coming. This is the time. It's coming to get me. And he would get his bow ready because he knew there was an attack coming. And it wouldn't come, and he'd put his bow back down. And then he would keep going through the whole night. And then eventually the the sun would come out and it would start shining through the trees. And he would be able to see the flowers in the field. And he would be able to see the edge of the path that they walked in. And then he would begin to look around and make sure he was safe. And every time what the young American Indian boy would see was he would turn around and he would see the silhouette of a person. He would see the silhouette of his father. His father, with his bow and arrow, stayed there in the darkness with his son the entire night. And if anything happened, the father was there to protect him. It was a way that he understood on that next morning that no matter what you go through, no matter how scared you are, no matter what darkness you find yourself in, if you focus on the right thing, the father has always been there the whole time, making sure that you were safe, making sure that you were protected. And we can't just walk away and say, I did this by myself when the father has been right there. We have to watch. We have to understand that the the father has always been there watching and waiting. Most of all, the father has been there protecting. Number three, there's only four, so we're moving right along here. Connection. We have to understand the connection. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. Remember I told you the Lord caused was going to be important? The Lord caused and then a strong east wind by night. Those two are important things. And this is why. We have to connect what is happening with God's hand. When you are, when, when you are connected, you will go farther than you determined you could go. The American meteor, Meteorological, I had to slow that one down, society, did a study that showed something very specific about this area where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. There was a phenomenon that would happen. And if the wind would blow from the east, strong east wind, for up to 10 hours all night, it would cause the water to separate up to a mile wide and the water would be 10 feet high. It's a legitimate thing that happened. And people have used this to try to scientifically prove that the Bible is not a true uh, historical document, that it's just something that was written. Because, it, but, but, but what it does is it shows something so much different. It, it doesn't disprove the Bible because what you have to understand is that everything that was created, in, in, in my belief, and what the Bible says is that God created the heavens and the earth. God created the land and the water. God created man, bird, and the beast of the field, and the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air. And so in verse 21, he says, stretch out your hand, and the Lord caused the Lord caused yes this might be an actual thing but if we just think about it as a scientific thing that happens every now and then like it was just accidentally going to happen by coincidence right when they needed to cross this was the time no we have to focus on the fact that the Lord caused it to happen when he made it he knew that this would happen when he led them out he led them to the Red Sea on purpose because he wanted Moses to show the people of Israel the connection between between God's word and their freedom. Stretch your hand out over the sea, Moses, and the water separated. Is it a coincidence or is it the fact that God moves for his people in such a way that yes, it might be something that happens, but it happens when God says so. And if it never happened before or it never happened again, the fact remains that when they when Moses stretched out his hand, it happened. Now maybe, maybe the coincidence could happen once. But then they got to the other side and Moses stretched out his hand again and it closed. So maybe that could happen. But the, the, the truth of the matter is God causes it to open. God causes it to close. God causes you to live. God causes you to die. God causes you to inhale. God causes you to exhale. God causes you to live happy. God, God picks you up when you live uh, uh, sad or, or defeated. There is something about the presence of God that when we let it live inside of us, new things begin to happen. And what this shows me is that you can gain success without God. 
but you can have favor with God. You can have recovery without him, but you can completely destroy addiction with him. And you can have a life apart from him, but you can truly live with him. There's something about being connected to God that makes you untouchable. The enemy can't hold you. Death can't stop you. The grave can't keep you. When I connect myself to Jesus, his resurrection becomes my resurrection. And I live free because of who he is. There is a relationship between your move and God's word. The last thing I got to tell you is affection. God's affection for you. Verse 30, so the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. The Lord saved Israel. I thought about that and I thought about how God saved me. Maybe not from the hand of the Egyptians, but it was captivity. Maybe I've never been to Egypt in my life, but I know what it's like to be bound. I know what it's like to be captive. And God saved Israel. And God saves me. He saves you. This is God's plan for all people. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering. It means he's gracious towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves us too much to leave us without a plan, without a purpose, without a way out, without a Savior. Paul said again in Romans 8, 29, For he... For who he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And I've heard people make this argument with me according to this verse. There are certain people who are predestined for heaven. And there are certain people who are predestined for hell. That is completely contrary to what the verse before that just said. God's will is that everybody comes to repentance. So maybe they made a mistake. Maybe the Bible just has a little bit of a contradiction. But I know a little bit about God. And I know that God's word does not contradict God's word. That God's word is true. And I think where we're missing it here is that uh, predestined literally means God decreeing something from eternity. The decree is this. You are predestined to be what you were created to be. Does it mean you're predestined to go to heaven or hell? No, it means you are predestined to be brought back into the perfect image of God. And when you give yourself to Jesus, he takes away all your flaws all your sin, all your pain, all your struggle, and he gives you a new identity that in the eyes of God, you are not the fallen person that you used to be. You are created new in his image. God is renewing you. He's rebooting you back to the manufacturer specs. All the things that have been downloaded into your life, all the troubles, all the pain, all the hurt, he's removing them and giving you a fresh hard drive. Because that's who God is. And I close with this. His affection didn't stop there. His direction doesn't stop in Egypt. God led Israel to the Red Sea. They seen a dead end. They seen a watery grave. They seen a problem. But I want to let you know that your problem is part of God's process. Your problem is part of God's process. Maybe you've been in the same place that they are. You tell God, I tried. I did the best I could do. I guess this is it for me. You brought me to this river for a reason. This is where I die, God. I'm okay with it. At least you brought me out of Egypt. But I want to present another op option for you. What if the grave you're looking at isn't for you? What if God brought you to that place not to destroy you, but to destroy your enemy? Keep you free from the bondage. The Red Sea was meant to destroy the things that keep, kept God's people away from him. God put a fire, cloud, a pillar between Israel and Egypt. In Genesis 3, God said, I'm going to put hatred between the serpent and the man. But in the gospel, God put Jesus between us and judgment. God's always got something in the middle. Don't worry about what's in front. Don't worry about what's behind. There's always something in the middle. Don't leave your life 
not noticing what God has put in the middle, right in the middle of your life, right in the middle of your situation, right in the middle of your pain, right in the middle of your hurt, right in the middle of your struggle. There's always something. What does your Red Sea look like? What is standing in front of you right now that says you can't do it? The devil is a liar and the father of all lies. The Red Sea is there not to destroy you, but that when you get through it, it's going to destroy your enemy. Because you know what? Never again in the Bible. Now, Israel was captive. They were, they were bound and took into slavery multiple times because they didn't honor God the right way. But they never were taken back to Egypt. When they got out of Egypt, they got all the way out of Egypt. And when God pulls you out of what you're in, he will pull you all the way out. Not just a little bit. Not just a right now blessing. He will pull you all the way out. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are here, that we could be in your presence. God, I pray that you've spoken to hearts today. I pray that you have shown us who you are and the direction that you have for our life. I pray that we could always honor you with everything that we were created to be.